Now let's imagine a rigid solid body of random shape like this. Then, if I know its moment of inertia about an axis passing through its center of mass, once more where the center of mass shows its the boss, right? If I know the moment of inertia about that, let me call it ICM, then the claim of the parallel axis theorem, which is what this is called, is that if I have any other axis that is parallel to this axis, which is passing through the center of mass, and if that parallel axis is at a distance d from this axis, then if I call the moment of inertia of this body about that axis, which can be inside or outside the body, it can be anywhere, that moment of inertia, let me call it I some p, yeah, then I p equals I of center of mass plus mass of this entire body into d square, where the d is the distance between these two lines. Now you can spend some time to figure out why this is true, it's not very difficult to prove. One of those rare occasions where the derivation is quite intuitive. Yeah? Try that now. Now I'm sure that you would have got the answer, but still let's try and solve it in the easiest way possible, right? Because whenever you want to solve or prove something, you have to take the lazy approach. Try and do as little work as possible to prove as much as possible. So the first thing you can decide though is what coordinate system to choose. So let's say here x, y, z, and it's as good as, you know, moving your body is as good as moving your coordinates. So let's bring our body and wonder, where do you want to fix the origin to be? Now, I'm going to use one of my most favorite phrases without laws of generality. Why I like it so much is it reduces so much work. Without laws of generality, I can make the center of mass the origin. So that the body goes and sits there very cozily. And then, without laws of generality, I can align the axis of rotation along the z-axis. Right? In other words, take the z-axis along that particular axis passing through the center of mass. Then, I can also do one more thing which is turn the body such that the other axis, the p-axis, is along my, is on my x-axis. Again, without laws of generality. Now, we've done all this, we've chosen the coordinate system in what I think is the simplest possible way. Then we're ready to attack this problem. So, given we have this, if I turn this so that my xz plane is right over here, then one important observation to make now is because we've taken the axis or the axis, both of them along the z-axis, one of the coordinates of your point doesn't matter anymore. Can you tell me which one it is? So it's a solid body, right? It's in all three dimensions. A general points, coordinates here will be x, y, z. But my claim is one of those coordinates doesn't matter because the axis is along the z-axis. Both these axes are parallel, right, to the z-axis. Now, which is that? Now, which quantity will not matter over here? Whether you are up or down, yeah, will not at all matter because your distance from the either of the axes doesn't depend on that at all. You can go as high as you want, as low as you want. It won't matter. And what is the coordinate that determines how high you are going and low you are coming? The z. So what we are showing you here is, for this particular question, you have eliminated the need for the z coordinate by taking your axis along the z axis. So all you care about are the coordinates x, y, because root of x square plus y square will give you your distance from that particular z axis. Correct? Now let's pick a random point somewhere there which has the coordinates x, y, z but you don't care about the z. So now, because the distance is d between the p axis, let's call it, and the center of mass axis, then the coordinates of this axis will be, or the intersection point of this axis and x axis will be d, 0, 0. Correct? Now all of this you can see over here. Now if I pick a random point, x, y, z, then what we've established is z coordinate is not going to come into the picture at all. Let it just be there. Yeah? Now, if you had found out the moment of inertia of this point, of let's say mass m, about the original axis, what would it have been? m into x squared plus y squared, right, within brackets. Yeah. Why? It's going to be that distance d squared, and you know that from distance formula. You don't have to go too deeply into that. Let's call that our ICM, or the moment of inertia of this point about the center of mass. Yeah. What will your ICM be then for the overall body? If you take every single mass and calculate that value, so m1 into x1 squared plus y1 squared plus m2 into so on, within brackets, if you add all of them, you'll get the total ICM of the entire body. So let that be over there. We'll use it. Yeah. But what is the moment of inertia of this point about this new axis, the p axis? You need the distance from that axis squared, right, multiplied by the mass. So the mass is m multiplied by that distance. Let's call it r2 squared. But what is r2 squared going to be? It's going to be y squared plus instead of x, it's going to be x minus d over here, right? So you can write it as m into x minus d the whole square 
plus y square. This is going to be equal to mn2 if you expand that term x square plus d square minus a 2 into xd plus the y square that is there already. So we'll rearrange this so that you get m into x square plus y square over there plus a m into d square minus 2 into mx into d. Now what I want you to do is if you take this for every single body, right, each of them having some mass say m1, m2, m3 so on, then you'll get sigma mi into xi square plus yi square over here. Then what is that equal to? That is just equal to our original ICM, which is the moment of inertia about the center of mass axis. So that comes here. Plus sigma of mass was multiplied by this d square. But the good thing about the d square is it's a constant. So you take it out. You'll get d square into sigma of just the masses, which is just the total mass. So total mass into d square. What about that term over there, the last term? You can take minus 2d out common. So you'll have sigma mi xi for all the point masses in this rigid body. But what is that equal to? That's the numerator of my XCM, right? Yeah, X center of masses, sigma mi xi divided by the total mass. But now in this case, my XCM is zero, which means this numerator has to be zero. So that term vanishes, which gives you the IP, which is where you began with, right? Equals your ICM plus total mass into D square. In effect, you've proved the parallel axis theorem. Now, one thing I want you to observe that this is not happening because we took the center of mass to be the origin. Yeah, you could have taken the center of mass as some other point x, y, z and solve the problem. The math would have been a little more tedious, but you would have got the same answer. It's independent of the coordinate system we choose. So you get ICM plus MD squared equals your moment of inertia about that axis P, which has to be parallel. Now, I want you to observe this is valid for any solid rigid body. This sheet works everywhere as long as you keep your axis parallel to the axis through the center of mass. Now, the best way to learn a tool is to use it, right, immediately. So let's bring our familiar ring and we know the moment of inertia about that center of mass, right? What is it? MR squared. Then if I move my axis to the side, then I know that it's very difficult to find the moment of inertia unless we have the parallel axis theorem. Because now I know the moment of inertia about the center of mass axis which is going to be MR squared. I know the distance I've moved this axis parallelly. Yeah. And in this case, distance will be R. It can be anything. It doesn't matter which means I can find out the moment of inertia about this new axis. Let me call it some IP as usual. Then my IP will be equal to ICM, which is MR squared plus M into D square, where this case the D is R itself. So MR square plus MR square, you'll get 2 into M into R squared. So in other words, the moment of inertia doubles when you move the axis parallel till it reaches one of the edges. Now, can we bring back our original rod as well? You know that if you had the rod, and if the axis passes through the center of mass, the moment of inertia is ml square by 12. Of course, the rod is assumed to be uniform, right? We're not mentioning it all the time, but it's what we're assuming. Then now, if I move that axis such that it reaches one end of that rod, then we derive the answer for this question back then. But now if I ask you, what's the moment of inertia about that axis? What will your answer be? Yeah, you can do this now, right? You have ICM, which is going to be ml square by 12, because that's the center of mass. You moved it by a distance L by 2. So you're going to have M into D square. Here the D is L by 2, the whole square. Then if you add these two, right, together, you'll get ML square by 3, which is what you got in the beginning as well. So you did now in 30 seconds what took quite some time to do back then. And now you can take many more examples of this. And as you solve more problems, you will start appreciating the ease of using the parallel axis theorem. Keep in mind it's applicable for rigid bodies and when you look to apply this is when you know the moment of inertia about some axis passing through the center of mass.